three key aspects of observational learning as a theory is that it occurs by watching others, noting the consequences, so if others are positively reinforced, we're more likely to repeat that or imitate that behaviour. If they're punished, we're less likely to imitate that behaviour. And given the consequences are a key feature of observational learning, there's a degree of overlap here with operant conditioning. But the difference is that operant conditioning is direct, i.e. the learner is reinforced or punished. With observational learning, it's indirect, it's vicarious. So we see someone else get punished or reinforced, and then, like I said before, we'll either imitate the behaviour or we won't. Now, some of the textbooks state that there are only four stages of observational learning. They combine motivation and reinforcement. But let me assure you that VCAR, when this has been examined in the past, have asked a question back in 2007 on the five stages of observational learning, where we actually split motivation and reinforcement. Attention is obviously the most important stage of observational learning. If we can't pay attention, how are we going to be able to retain the information required? How are we going to be able to reproduce behaviour? But it's not just watching. We've got to be able to actively watch in order to observe distinctive features of the behaviour. Attention is influenced by the motivation of the learner. They've got to be motivated to learn the behaviour. They've got to be able to avoid distractors. The model needs to make the behaviour distinctive, i.e. so that the observer can identify distinctive features and break it down into elements. Bandura felt we're more likely to pay attention to the model if we respect them, they're similar to us, popular, etc. Stage 2, retention. We've got to be able to make a mental, cognitive representation i.e. in terms of the elements of the behaviour step by step. So the more meaningful we can make that cognitive representation, the more accurately we'll be able to reproduce it when required. Reproduction is determined by our ability to actually perform the manoeuvre. So for instance, my son, who's eight, he can't start the lawnmower. He's able to attend to the steps required in terms of putting the lawnmower in gear, pumping in the petrol, etc. But he's not strong enough to pull the starting cord. He's limited by his lack of physical strength. Now these last two stages might seem straightforward, motivation and reinforcement. But where students get unstuck is they talk about the learner's got to be motivated to learn the behaviour. That actually is talking about attention. Because you have to be motivated to learn the behaviour in order to attend to it. So when we talk about motivation, the learner's got to be motivated to perform behaviour. So that's a key distinction. When you're talking about motivation, don't talk about being motivated to learn. That applies to attention. Talk about motivated to perform the behaviour, whether it be starting the lawnmower, starting a car, operating your iPhone, etc. And as we have with operant conditioning, if we reinforce the behaviour of the learner, they're more likely to repeat it in the future.